Chapter Eight of Workers Together. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Workers Together or an Endless Chain by Pansy. Chapter Eight: The Baby's Link. The little baby, Delia Curtis's treasure, was laid to rest amid a wealth of flowers. A very unusual experience in that street was that funeral occasion. Death had come before to many of the homes and the neighbors had been as sympathetic and as attentive as their hard, busy lives gave them time for being. But they watched curiously the comers and goers at Mr. Curtis's door, the minister, and the doctor, and the teacher, and the girls and the boys in Mrs. Saunders's class, and joy. What did it all mean? They questioned one of another. Who was that minister? Why, he was pastor of the Packard Place Church, where Delia Curtis went to Sabbath school. And who was that doctor? He had not attended the Curtis baby, had he? Oh, no, but they wondered that he hadn't been called. They say he is a great doctor, and he is the new superintendent at Packard Place. And Miss Mason was Delia's teacher, and all those girls coming and going with flowers and things were in her class, and those boys belonged to another class, and were to act as bearers, and Dr. Everett's carriage was to take Mr. and Mrs. Curtis and Dahlia to the grave, and the girls were all going in another carriage that they said the church provided, and there was to be singing at the funeral by the Sunday school choir, and altogether the dwellers in that region began to have a feeling, which they did not express in words, that there was a good deal of friendliness and sympathy and attention connected with the Packard Place Church. There wasn't six people beside our own when my baby died, and not a flower to be seen, though it was midsummer, nor a carriage, said one poor mother, half in sadness, half in bitterness, as she went back over her sorrowful past. But she added in grave truthfulness, To be sure, my Melissa didn't belong to no Sunday school, and we never went to church. Maybe things would have been different if we had. Neither do the Curtises go to church, said a crisp neighbor. I don't believe they've darkened the doors of a church since they lived here. But Dahlia does. She went every now and then, and to Sunday school, too. Them young folks is real attentive. I never see anything like it. I'm glad of it, too, she declared, rising above her envious thoughts with an effort. If there's ever a time when folks need friends, it's when they are in trouble like this, and flowers and carriages and things mayn't be much, but they make the world seem a little less dreary after all. Sunday schools is good things if they make folks do this way, and I wish my Melissa belonged to one. Meantime, the girls had been having their lesson. They had forgotten that they were kin to Delia Curtis until they saw her tear-swollen eyes, and heard her murmured words of gratitude. Gay little Fanny Tarrant, who lived in a different sphere entirely, and had not known the Curtis girl even by name, lent her a black sack that just fitted her, and herself arranged the lace in the neck, and took more serious thought, and spoke more serious words, than perhaps she had done in months before. They came and went frequently, all of them, during the hours that intervened between the death and the funeral, and consulted together on the steps, or in the little parlor, about what we are to do, or how we are to sit, and felt a sense of importance, as girls do, over all things that bring them into life as actors, responsible for ever so small a part of the duties of the hour, and grew more intimate, in a quiet way, than they had ever thought of being, and they cried together, every one of them, with Delia around that little coffin, and cemented their interest in her as nothing else could have done. A strange place, perhaps, you think, for cultivating friendship, this baby's funeral, and yet the sense of sisterhood was awakened among those girls that afternoon. Dr. Everett leaned against the narrow door in the small square hall, and studied them, they were his girls, and as he looked at responsibilities, he was bound in honor to do for them all that he could. What could he do? What would this afternoon's experience help him to do? The beautiful baby in the coffin was at rest, 
his sweet life here ended his life in heaven begun and yet perhaps baby though he was his work here was not ended could not those gathered about his coffin be reached and blessed through the influences of this day among the girls hester mason was the one who held the doctor's thoughts she was of a different type from the others in one sense harder to reach he tried to study her face softened now under the play of emotions new to her trouble had touched her in many forms most of them hardening forms but she had never before sat near to a little coffin and mingled her tears with mourners she had a striking face beautiful it might have been called had there only been more refinement of expression certainly it was a face which showed strength or at least possibilities of strength it remained to be seen whether the world would be better or worse because of her being one of its countless numbers it was almost certain to be decidedly the one or the other hers was not a passive nature man though he was dr everett studied her dress carefully and understood its attempts better than many women would have done it was more subdued than usual he did not know this he had never noticed her carefully before had he known that she went back after she had reached the street and signalled her car and actually waited for another car while she unpinned and removed some of the red roses from her hat because of a certain vague unreasoning sense of incongruity between them and the house of mourning he would have felt encouraged not so much because she saw the incongruity as because her heart had responded to the suggestion that she should model her dress to suit sorrowful eyes he plainly saw this cultured man that the colors of her dress did not harmonize but he also felt rather than saw what had not occurred to miss mason that it was not because she would not have preferred harmony in color and texture or because she did not know to a certain extent what harmony was but simply that she was poor and that the blue dress which she had persisted in having one winter would not turn green to fit the felt hat which fell to her from her aunt on another winter so perforce they must be worn together and red roses being her delight red roses she would wear despite the shades of blue and green had she been cultured she would not have worn the contrasting colors would have had no delight in them she was not cultured and yet dr everett felt that it was a certain uneducated sense of the beautiful that made her so eager after all this brightness studying her he made a discovery miss mason's faultless black silk suit harmonizing in every particular did not seem to move her namesake hester she looked at her it is true and admired but it was with an intelligent sense of the fact that many pounds had been put together to make up the faultlessness hester mason believed that given the money she could make herself look as elegant as her sabbath school teacher but as she never expected to have the money she was therefore in a sense indifferent but the watcher saw that she looked at joy saunders with new eyes almost as an artist might look at a picture joy was a revelation to her a young girl nearly as young as hester herself with beautiful hair arranged so simply that she could see all the processes and felt sure that she could arrange her own after the same fashion a very simple very plain black dress much plainer and simpler than hester's own a little puff of soft lace about her neck and that was all and about it all was an indescribable charm that hester mason felt to her finger ends dr everett could not see all the thoughts that ran eagerly through her mind as she gazed at joy he did not know that she knew to the fraction of a penny how much the material of joy's dress had cost nor that she calculated to a nicety the probable quantity used and knew how to make a garment exactly like it he did not know that she said to herself that lace is nothing but wash illusion and there isn't a bit more than a half yard in it and her gloves are only two button i've got three on mine and then she looked down at her own long-worn carelessly handled out at the fingers soiled at the wrists the only charm left to them being the three buttons 
What a contrast they were to Joy's neat fitting black ones! Incongruous thoughts these, you think, for a funeral occasion. Yet I hope I shall not shock you when I call them elevating thoughts. Actually, Hester Mason was taking a step forward in the story of her life. She was getting her first dim idea that to be a lady was not necessarily to have plenty of money, and to spend it freely on one's adorning. Until this moment she had believed that if she had the leisure and the wealth of the fine ladies, she could be as fine as they. Something in Joy Saunders gave her a feeling that this was false reasoning, here was a refinement that in money was within her reach, and yet was as far beyond and above her as the mountains. All this, as I said, the doctor did not understand, yet he saw that Joy Saunders was at once a fascination and a puzzle to this keen-eyed girl. It will do her good to have Joy for a study, he said to himself. I wonder what sort of a home she has. Miss Mason knows, possibly. I must try to discover. I wonder what effect an hour or two in Mrs. Saunders' sunset room would have on her. I would like to try it. How can I bring about an invitation and an acceptance to that room for an afternoon with tea in state? The invitation can be more easily managed than the acceptance, probably. There are several things to learn before I attempt it. Busy with the train of thought which the circumstances of the hour had started, he found himself presently standing near Miss Mason, while they waited a summons to the carriage. True to his habit, he made use of the opportunity. Who is the girl in blue, a decided blue? Miss Mason looked her annoyance. Her name is Mason, Hester Mason, not a relative of mine, I beg you to believe. Had she been... I should have tried to secure her a black dress for this occasion. I wish I had, as it is. How that blue dress jars! What sort of a person is she? Oh, I don't know. The sort of person who will wear a bright blue dress to a funeral doctor when she forms part of the procession. Does that enlighten you any? All this in undertone, with a suppressed nervous little laugh at its close. Hardly, said the doctor. That might be owing to the accident of her having but one dress to wear. Perhaps that does not enlighten you. You may not have realized the possibility of such a situation. But there are people thus circumstanced. Has she parents living? I'm sure I don't know. She is only nominally a member of my class. I don't think she has been present four times this season. I have never known anything about her. I learned by accident where she lived, and it is so far out of the world that I don't know how to get to it. I don't like the girl's appearance. She is one of the loud-voiced, gay sort. She converses on the street car in a tone loud enough to be heard by all the passengers. That may possibly be because she has never been taught the propriety of conversing in a low tone, the doctor said, and then he attended Miss Mason to the carriage, and decided that she was not at present the one to help him materially in trying to help Hester Mason. An apparent accident threw him, later in the day, in the way of receiving a bit of information. He was passing out from Mr. Curtis's door just at dusk, whither he had returned to call professionally on the worn-out mother, when he heard the woman who stood on the doorstep of the next house, and whom he recognized as a neighbor of the family, say to the woman in the door, That Hester Mason looked better today than I have ever seen her. She left off some of her finery, but she was dreadful out of place somehow. The doctor paused. Mrs. Simmons, I believe. I met you at Mrs. Curtis's this morning. And he lifted his hat courteously. May I ask if you are acquainted with Hester Mason, and if you can tell me anything of her family? She is one of the young ladies of my Sabbath school. Mrs. Simmons was voluble. She loved to talk, and besides, gentlemen rarely raised their hats to her. Oh, yes, I can tell you all about her. She ain't got no folks to speak of, only a drunken father, and an aunt she lives with. She is a fast girl, and no mistake. Out of nights till twelve and one o'clock every blessed night of her life. 
Fact is, I've known of her being out till morning now and then. Goes to balls, you know, and such places, along with any young fellow she can coax to spend money on her. She is a shop girl, down there in one of them Vale Street stores, and she gets acquainted with all sorts. Her aunt is a decent kind of body, tries to be, but what with a drunken brother, and this girl who has got away beyond her, she has a hard life of it. You see, I know all about them. I lived right next door to them for a year or two. I'm glad if Hester Mason goes to your Sunday school. It is the first good that I've ever heard of her. Oh, I don't know anything so very dreadful bad, you know. She is decent enough as girls of that kind go, I guess. But my Melissa don't have nothing to do with her. Her father won't let her. Thank you, said the doctor in the first pause for breath. He had received all the information from that source that he desired. One more effort he made that evening. He met Joy on the stairs, as she was going swiftly up and he was going swiftly down. Both were in haste. Miss Joy, he said, did you notice the young girl in a blue dress? Yes, I noticed her a good deal. What of her, Miss Joy? She is a girl to be helped said Joy, speaking slowly, choosing her words with care, making pauses between them. "'Thank you,' he said again, and the tones were different from those which had said it to Mrs. Simmons. As he went on down the stairs and down the street, he told himself that Joy and the sunset room would help, but there must be some connecting link to bring it about. In less than five minutes he saw a possible connecting link, but it filled him with dismay. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tricia G.